in New York City. <laughs> okay, in New York City. Okay. So what was the scene like for you when you were growing up? You know, what, what style of music were you exposed to the most, you know, because it was a mainstream? That's a great question. Um, so I, I lived in New York City until I was, you know, six, seven. I was still a kid when we moved to the suburbs. Mm. And um, even though where we lived wasn't far from the city, when I was kind of first getting into music in my teenage years, uh, it felt very separate. So I, it's not like I was out going to see musicians in clubs in New York when I was 13. Mm. Not at all, actually. I was just kind of only exposed to what was going on in the suburbs. And I think that would be different maybe now, um, you know, if I grew up now, yep. uh, you know, in the suburbs. But since it was, you know, the 80s and 90s and, and whatever, it just wasn't easy. It wasn't as easy to get around. It was before, like, Uber and ride sharing and all that stuff. And, and I had limited ways to get into the city. So I, it's not like I, I was in the city all the time listening to music. That said, every once in a while I would be. So I, you know, I got to see uh, some amazing music even as, as a kid. But it was really only when I went to uh, to college in Boston that I started being able to go hear great music every night consistently and to be around great musicians all the time. All right, yeah. What age were you when you started playing your instrument? I was thirteen. Thirteen years old. And did you take any official lessons, or you just picked up a guitar and were like, "This is yeah. very cool to do." I did. I totally did. I, but it, it was interesting. So I had um, a teacher for a little while, mm. and then he moved away. So I, I probably had lessons for the first year and a half, maybe two years. And then my teacher moved away, and then I didn't have a teacher anymore mm. for a really long time. I mean, I guess I maybe three years I went without a teacher. And mm. I just mainly learned from guitar magazines, actually. Mm. believe it. That's all I really could find at mm. the time before a real – access to cool guitar stuff on the internet. So, um, yeah, guitar magazines. And then eventually I found a great teacher named Arlen Roth, who was my teacher for the last year before I went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Would you say that when, when you were a student, you were already making compartments, let's say, oh, this is rhythm, and I'm going to practice rhythm right now. This is the harmonic stuff. I'm going to work on harmonic stuff. Or did it come all natural through learning songs? You So there's a song, oh, you true. go home and... That's a great question. At first, it definitely was learning songs. It was like started with very simple songs, like songs you hear on the radio, and then it got into more like um, uh, like learning like Led Zeppelin songs and Hendrix songs, stuff that had more specific guitar related content, mm -hmm. like Little Wing by Jimi Hendrix, there you um, go. like that. And then concurrently with that, I was kind of learning to play the blues, so improvising mm -hmm. over the blues progression, you know, and and the feeling of the blues. Um, did I think about it as like separate, like melody, harmony and rhythm? I don't think so. I think I kind of, it was all just one thing mm. at first music and guitar and, you know, playing songs. Like you said, I think later it kind of maybe split into like specific areas, but at that, at that time I was just trying to pick up anything I could, mm. like anything I could find, I wanted to learn how to play it. And there were, you know, maybe if a rhythmic element was difficult, I would figure that out, but I never really thought, okay, I'm practicing rhythm now, I'm practicing, mm. you know, it was more holistic. Fantastic. So that was more like a repertoire, the songs that were teaching you. One song was maybe more complex rhythmically, and there you went. So suddenly you could play blues and funky and shuffle. It's, it, it was more song-driven, I think, at least at first, but it's not like I had an amazing repertoire. It's like I would learn these songs, but I was really just taking the information from the songs mm. and and learning how to you know master it in my limited way but um I, when i say that i wasn't really focused on the repertoire aspect of it is that's because i didn't really have anybody to play music with you mm. know when i was growing up until i got to college so like having this great repertoire wouldn't have really done much for me because i had no one to play with mm. what artists were you listening to and getting inspired for playing blues Uh, Albert King, Albert Collins, um, Lightning Hopkins, Howlin' Wolf, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm -hmm. um, before that, clapped it like you know mm -hmm. some classic rock blues influences like the Stones and and um, Hendrix and Clapton, of course, and Jimmy Page. Um, yeah, those were like a lot of my early influences and still my influences. Mm -hmm. You know, I love all those those musicians. So, was your first guitar Stratocaster? 
before I got that Stratocaster, I got this crazy Ibanez. It was like the cheapest guitar they had at Sam Ash. It was used, and it was like a monstrosity. It was just un- It was like one of those guitars that's shaped like an X. Or something. <laughs> and I had it, and I couldn't play it at all. And then, you know, a- after after a little while, I got the Strat that I'm still playing. That Mexican Strat. Mm. What do you think was the most important moment, person, or an event in your education? Uh, I think I've been lucky to have have a bunch of those kind of, you know, important moments. I had some great teachers, you know, before I went to Berkeley. I mentioned this guy, Arlen Roth, who was mm. really fantastic. Um, my first teacher was amazing, this guy, Frank DeBretti, uh, who's still around. He lives in Houston, Texas, and, and plays great. Um, he was like a session guitarist so he had the aesthetic of like knowing how to do a little bit of everything and he really challenged me even when i was just a real beginner he would bring in you know bluegrass tunes and Django reinhardt solos and like mm. amazing stuff and i feel like that push really helped early on um arlen roth this teacher that i had right before going to college was amazing because we would just play mm. like for hours, you know what I mean? Just jam on, on stuff. And that was really amazing because he was, you know, one of the, one of the great players. Um, uh, so just being around that was amazing. When I got to Berkeley, um, one guy that had a lot of, um, influence on me was David Tronzo, the slide mm-hmm. guitar. Yeah. Slide yeah. guitar player. He has got a couple of videos on my masterclass. Like he you've got. Us? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great, man. <laughs> he's just, I, I got to check those out. He's really just a brilliant guy. You know, he's he's a, a, a thinker, and he sees things in different ways than most people, and he's able to art- articulate things in a different way than most people are. So being around him was great. Um, there was another teacher at Berkeley who was fantastic named Hal Crook, who was more of a jazz, t- uh, you know, uh, a jazz musician, and mm. um, he played trombone, and, and he taught ensembles. But he also had a very holistic approach to music. You know, he heard and discussed things that other people weren't hearing and discussing so you know like you said about harmony and rhythm and melody he could really draw attention to like you know having you focus on the dynamics or focus on the articulation Mm. you know not just the notes like most people Mm. focus on so that was inspiring yeah and that that kind of um awakened me to some new possibilities could you recommend any textbooks that everyone should have in their collection of instructional material something that is must to have as a guitar player or as a jazz improviser. That's tough. Um, definitely the Omni book, the Charlie, Charlie Parker. Parker. Charlie Parker. Charlie, yeah. Because for me, that's when I kind of understood how bebop works, how the voice leading of bebop worked. Hmm. It all made sense. because you can play the quote unquote right notes and it still sounds wrong. But hmm. when you understand Charlie Parker, you're like, Oh, that's, this note needs to go to this note. You know, hmm. this needs to lead to this voice and then it all makes sense mm. and then endless variations and also just to see how rhythmic he was mm. you know and it still sounds modern today you know so um it's a resource that i you know i go back to from time to time to, to re- refresh my my memory of about uh charlie parker's brilliance mm. it's definitely a must-have um when i was in college i remember i really liked dave liebman's book uh, a chromatic approach okay tell um, me that Yeah, that that was a good one because I I hadn't been exposed to anything like that before. Mm. So that that one was like the the there's like an index in the back of some lines mm. and kind of you know I was like oh you can do this cool so that was great. Mm. But you know what like to to be honest and and this might not be a popular opinion but I got a lot out of just having a real book around mm. and or any kind of any song that has the any any book that has the the repertoire in it. Mm. And just playing through the songs mm. and seeing how the songs are constructed, you know, and tr- hopefully memorizing them, you know. And, you know, you can solve recordings to, to make sure that the changes are correct or that the melody is correct. But just having that that amount of material and repertoire in one place is really amazing, you know, because it's, it's from all the eras. You know, there's some early jazz tunes, there's bebop tunes, there's songbook tunes, there's Joe Henderson tunes, and, like, that window into the composer's language, it was actually really valuable, especially as like a young student mm. who was exposed to the cats playing this music live, you know, that was, uh, you know, it was all I had and it was, it was great, you know? So that, that was a good resource too. 
How often was it possible to play in Boston? You know, when you were out there, you know, did they have any, you know, jam sessions that if you decided to play every night, you could with your classmates? And that's a great question. Um, I was very proactive about trying to play as much um, because I had spent, you know, a good portion of my previous time as a musician practicing. Mm. Felt the need to, to, you know, not. Not necessarily. I, still, I wanted to keep practicing, but I felt the need to play with people. Mm. I felt like it was really important for me. So I played as much as possible, and um, part of it was through the school. Mm. It was like I would make sure that my classes all involved as much playing as possible. So specifically, I took a lot of ensembles mm. in school. Um, and then after class ended, I would get together with people. I was very proactive in putting together these bands, and, and we, we didn't have any gigs, but mm. we, we just played all night long. And I feel like that was really essential for me. Hmm. Maybe more important than the practicing part. The practicing part was obviously very important too, but just make sure you play enough. I, I feel like that's pretty critical. Hmm. What or who does inspire you to learn more about music and innovate its elements? Um, so, so many different sources of inspiration. Um, I, I guess the most immediate one is like every every playing situation I'm in, mm -hmm. um, all the people that I'm surrounded by, you know, basically you just want to do, you want to do your best every time you play and you want to do the best for the music every time you play. So being in these situations, I always feel like I learn every time, you know, what I could have done better, either just by, by seeing what, what others are able to do or just imagining what I would want to be able to, to bring to the music. So it's really You know, I get a lot of inspiration from the playing situations, mm. you know, both from the people around me and then just from imagining how I w would want to approach it in an ideal world. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So that accounts for a lot. Um, sometimes my students really inspire me. You know, what, uh, when I teach, um, I try to challenge them the way I would want to be challenged. And that makes me raise my bar. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, hearing great players, you know, whether live or on record where I'm, you know, I'm inspired, mm. but uh, yeah, a lot of it comes from like the direct playing thing where I'm like, wow, you know, that either that tenor player sounded great tonight, or I would have loved to be able to bring something better to my acoustic guitar playing on this mm. track for example, you know, so things like that. So in what form do you enjoy it? Do you enjoy performing it, composing it, recording it, listening to it or teaching it? I mean, I love them all and they all play into one another. You know, I feel like The better I get at performing, the better I also get at teaching, and they kind of reinforce each other. You grow in different directions at the same time. Um, I think performing might, you know, if I had to choose one, I, I love, I love, I love playing music with people. Mm. Um, it, there doesn't have to be an audience there, but just, just, um, I really enjoy doing it like socially. Mm. You know, what I mean, I feel like that's part of the purpose of music is that social fabric that it has. You know, bringing people together and communicating. Uh, with each other in the moment, you know, I feel like that's, that's an important part of it for me. What attributes does music as artistic platform need to have in your opinion? So what does it mean to be an artist in your context? Um, there's, you know, many ways to answer it. I think one important aspect of it is that it has to be honest. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, you know, the, the best thing you can do for your audience, um, for the people you're playing with and for yourself is to, to play and compose or, or what all aspects to teach, to do it all honestly, you know, play the music you believe in, play the way you believe in. Um, and you have to be honest with yourself to, to get to that place. But I feel like when you are honest, uh, the music means more to you. Mm. And, and when that happens, it also means more to the listener. They're able to, feel the honesty and they really appreciate it because it's, it's kind of can be rare, you know, these days. Um, and it also teaches you a lot about yourself and who you are. So, um, to me, that's, that's a big part of it. How would you define music as a language? You know, every form of music has a different kind of, um, not, not set of rules, but like set of, um, paradigms and, and assumed, things that that everyone on the stage kind of agrees to you know or, or is aware of in some way it doesn't mean that you have to adhere to it 
um, specifically, but when when there's an either an ignorance of it or an avoidance of it, sometimes it's like it's like having a conversation where you don't speak the same language, hmm. right? And 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 those that are well versed in the language um, will hear it and react to it, and it, and it has to do with I believe uh, respecting the music. You know, whatever it is you play, if you play, you know, punk rock, if you play Gnawa music, if you play Afro-Cuban music with the clave, if you play jazz, if you play rock, they're all, when done right and done well, it's all so, um, every aspect of it is so important. So the more you care, the more you study, the more, the more you know, the more attention to detail you have, the more uh, well-versed you are in that language, the more you know the history, et cetera, et cetera. So... It's like having an informed conversation as opposed to an uninformed conversation. And when you have that kind of um, – when you're able to communicate on a higher level with other musicians, that's when some real magic starts to happen. You know what I mean? Whether it be a one-chord song or you know, a very complex jazz composition, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter. It just matters that everyone is, is 100 percent in and listening and attuned to the language. So I do feel like that aspect is important. And that way, when that is happening, you know, the audience, the listeners, they're, they're, they're able to witness something truly special, you know, and they feel it. Usually we want to be able to let go of all the considerations about the place. I mean, not, not ignore them, but let, let go and transcend mm -hmm. them and get to the place of pure music. Mm -hmm. But to do that, we have to have control over... Um, you know, acoustics, we have to have control over dynamics, we have to understand those things, and that's part of the musical language. What collaborations are you really proud of, the ones that uh, you either got asked to do or you wanted to do personally for such a long time? Man, I, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it all as like a, an unbroken string of um, music that's been played. You know, I'm proud of the tapestry of it all. Mm -hmm. um, You know, there are, you know, people who are, you know, I've been fan, a fan of for a long time that I've gotten to work with and thought, wow, that was great. But it's, it's really the combination and, and, the, and the, the tapestry of it all that I'm most proud of, you know, mm. of, of from my early youth to present day, how it's all kind of been woven together a lot by chance, a lot by luck, a lot by hard work, a lot by um, location. You know, and a lot by uncontrolled, you know, you know, just chance. But um, I love, I love how it's how it's come together. So yeah, uh, Golden Age, your album Golden Age. How long were you preparing the repertoire for Golden Age? And did you have any concepts in mind? What you wanted to make an album about? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I I did, but I feel like it all happened relatively organically I, you know and same for the the new music that i have recorded it's like it i feel like like i said before i feel like it's important to me to be honest about what i want to write and to have kind of a mental image of what it is in order to be able to write it now that said i don't sit down with a specific concept but i let the music kind of you know follow these ideas that i have these little like sparks mm -hmm. that kind of happened before the song is ever put to paper. And I try to follow that and see where it leads me. And, you know, in golden age, I think that it painted a picture of the time um, when it was written. And I think this, this next project will do the same thing. And, you know, to me it does. Um, and I think that's, that's what all you can do, right. Is like write something that's personal to you and meaningful to you and um, indicative of a time and place to you. And then, You know, everyone will see it in their own way, but it does paint a picture. Mm. And I think the picture comes through, and everyone will see it differently, but they see that there is a picture and, a, you know, an overarching uh, vision. There's a song, The Lights, on your album. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did you come around with that song? Well, What that particular one, yeah, sometimes the titles give it away. That one is, it's like, to me, I picture that one as like, you know, an empty stage And, and the lights come on mm. and no one's there. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a lit stage. Mm. I don't know. That's how I always picture that song. 
um, as just like an opening and closing statement. So what characteristics do define a good musician and hardworking professional? Well, I think good musician and hardworking professional are two different things because I know many who are one and not the other mm -hmm. um, on both sides of that. Um, I think a good musician is, uh, like I keep saying, is, is honest. I think a good musician is attuned to the bigger picture, meaning like you can be quote unquote good at music, but not necessarily a good musician. You, it, yeah. If that makes sense. Like as an instrumentalist. Exactly. Yeah. There are people that are very technical, technically skilled or very, very extremely capable at, at you know, either burning over chord changes or, or burning through all sorts of rhythms or all that stuff. But to me, the, the actual music is sometimes missing. Hmm. And then I know people that can't do any of that stuff, but the music is there and it's so enveloping and warm and everything you'd want. Um, my, you know, my ideal is, is some sort of combination of both. Hmm. But I think what the, the people who I admire the most do is that they either see or are somehow, um, innately intuitively connected to this big picture of music about what music is and what it does and how it communicates and how it affects people and and they know how to channel that and be a part of that so that's really what i'm looking for in the people that i play with that's what i'm trying to develop in myself it's not it's not just like a skill level or like being able to play stuff that's quote unquote hard or you know mastering uh, a million songs or anything like that. It's about, it's about infusing everything with, with real, um, emotion and meaning. Hmm. So to me, that's a good musician. Um, now a professional is a different thing because, um, that, that to me means more of like the, um, go to work and do uh, a good job at making the people that you work with comfortable, making them feel, like you're there for them and for their music. It also, in the sense, means something about the good musician of playing for the music and not playing for yourself. And sometimes that involves being a professional, meaning being on time, being prepared with the music, um, being, um, you know, capable of, of showing up with the right equipment, with the right sounds, with the music memorized, all those things that that add to the first part of making the music come to life. But it's, um, they're not necessarily one and, and the same, but, um, I'm always trying to work on both. You know, I want to be a better, uh, musician first and foremost, but I also want to be more of a professional. And if that means I have to remember to keep uh, pen and pencil in every guitar case, yeah. you know, it's <laughs> these minor details that, you know, can somehow, you know, if they make the music better, yeah. You know, if I if I need to make notes on something and, you know, I'm not prepared, that can hurt the music in the end, you know. So uh, they, they work together, but they're not, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Like I said, I know people that are extremely professional, but somehow, you know, I don't necessarily love their music. And other people that are extremely amazing musicians and maybe don't meet the criteria for, you know, professional in terms of, you know, being on time and all stuff, <laughs> stuff like that. But, you know, what's more important? So, um, for me, ideally it's, it's both, but mm. you know, if I had to pick one, I know what I would <laughs> What are the common mistakes and false assumptions students make in your opinion? And I think it's related to mainly guitar playing and being a professional musician. Um, twofold. I mean, uh, one, one big one is, um, thinking that they, they're supposed to play a certain way and not really playing like themselves hmm. think oh, I have to do this because this person does this, you know, this person I'm a fan of. So I think that that is a pitfall. And I always try to, to lead people away from that and into, you know, embracing who they are musically. Yeah. But I feel like that's how they're going to get the best results. And knowing that no one system works for everybody, just because I learned to play this way and feel like this is the best way to play. It might not be right for you, the student, so it's okay to, you know, reject the things that really don't work for you. I feel like you should take everything into consideration, but if you try it and you realize that it's not right for you, that's okay because we're all different. We all have different ways of playing, 
We all have different sounds that we're chasing. We have different bodies. So physically playing the instrument is different from person to person. That's one. Um, another uh, pitfall that students get into. Uh, sad to say, you know, some people uh, do believe that they're entitled to a career in music. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that's never the case. You know, you have to really work hard for, for to, to you know, playing music's an honor. It's like every day... I do feel blessed and, and so privileged to be able to do this for a living. Um, so it's hard work, but it's hard work that we love. But I have seen certain people think that everything should come to them. And when it doesn't, they get upset and frustrated and sometimes don't keep playing, which I think is sad. Um, so I think everybody should be aware that, you know, this is hard work, but if you love the work, it's, it's fun. It's fun, it's, yeah. It's great. It's it should be hard work that you love doing. That doesn't mean it's not hard, but it's something that you, that you love being a part of, and and um, you know, that's another area that I see sometimes students get frustrated with because they think that because they're enrolled in school and are, are paying for this college education that they're basically buying themselves a career in music, yeah. and it doesn't doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Hmm. Uh, uh, you really have to be so passionate about it, you know. Persistence, yeah. You have to be persistent, and you just have to love it, you know. And if you if you love it, you're going to be happy, hmm. you know. What I mean, and what's more important than that, you know? So if you really truly love it, you're going and and you immerse yourself in it. I believe that there's room for everybody hmm. in this business. I believe that there's you know the people that love it and immerse themselves in it and give it 100% are going to be just fine. Yourself as a musician, you have got not only a great repertoire, but also a lot of musicians you work with. So now let's say if, if you're putting a band together, uh, what is it that you like about or that you're looking for in a drummer, in a bass player, and in a piano player? So what is it that you like? Let's, ta- let's start with drums. What is it that you like about drums? I think it's going to be the same answer for everybody, for mm-hmm. every instrument. I, you know, I, I want people that make the music come alive. You know what I mean? I want them to care about uh, the music as a whole, not just their own playing. You know, there's so many people that are incredible on their instruments, but can they play a song and really tell the story of the song? Can they, um, you know, can they make it leap off the page? Are they receptive to what's going on in the moment so that we can communicate together you know, in a live situation and feed off each other and, you know, spark something greater than the sum of its parts. That's what I'm looking for. Of course, I have my specific, you know, qualities that I like in certain players. I like people that have a sense of melody Mm -hmm. and lyricism. And I mean, you know, as a drummer, as a bass player, as a piano player, yeah, I want to hear that in everybody. Um, I like people whose uh, feel, whose groove feels good. Mm -hmm. You know, and it could be swinging or it could be whatever, any something, you know, it feels good. It doesn't have to be uh, incredibly precise for me. For me, it just has to feel good. It makes me want to dance. I love that. Hmm. Um, but I feel like, you know, a bass player can make me want to dance. A piano player can make me want to dance. A drummer, of course, but a saxophone player can make me want to dance. You know, if they if they have that thing. Trumpet player. I play with a trumpet player who's every time I hear him play, I find myself shaking my head because it just feels great, you know? <laughs> Who is this? Keon Harold. Keon Harold. I haven't when heard he, of him. I'll check him out. When he plays, he tells a story, and I feel like that's something I want from, from all the musicians, too. I want to hear the story, hmm. you know? What your ordinary day look like? Well, unfortunately, something that's, that I struggle with is I don't have an ordinary day. Um, every day is different, which is a, a big challenge, right? Hmm. You know, it... it um, oftentimes I'm on the road, so I'm waking up in a hotel room and, and either going to a train or to a plane or to a sound check or, or whatever. So getting used to that is is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm home, uh, something that I, I'm trying to do more of is to just do regular person stuff, you know, to wake up and go for a run and make breakfast and, you know, um, read a book you know, to, to kind of try to take my dog to the dog park, to try and make that work-life balance a little bit better of, you know, when I'm home, I'm really going to be home, hmm. you know, 
paying attention to normal things. And then when I'm on the road, of course, I have to be on the road, and I can try and mimic some of those things as much as possible, like going for a run or, or um, you know. But I'm limited. I'm in the hotel. I don't have kitchen. Mm. Kitchen, you. Know? Um, so, uh, you know, just just trying to maintain a balance and a healthy lifestyle. I feel like that's that's a challenge for musicians. Yeah, the healthy lifestyle. Let's talk about that. So, how do you take care of your you know, mental health, your physical health, and, you know, your eating habits, if you were to compare your day in New York and day on the road? You know, the danger and something that I've struggled with is that I, what I did, <laughs> my attempt at consistency, not attempt, <laughs> but what I ended up doing is that my home life mimicked my road life, okay. and not, not the reverse. Just because I was more, I was on the road more than I was home. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm going to go to a restaurant th three times a day because that's what I do, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not, that's not cool. That's not healthy. So now I'm trying to have my road life mimic my home life. I'm trying to go to bed earlier, you know, try as much as possible as to detach myself from the uh, road part of it mm -hmm. so that I focus more on the music. But at the same time, you know, we are super privileged to be able to see the world like this. So when I am on the road, I do make a point to go out and see the places where I am and see the see the sights, meet the people. But um, these days, it, I, I try to balance that with kind of, you know, living as healthy a lifestyle as I can without sacrificing seeing the places that I'm in. Hmm. Have you had Have you ever had any physical injury in your hands? Or arms no, or shoulder. I, I really haven't. I've I've been lucky, and I think it's you know if any if you've, if you've ever seen me play, I play kind of unusually. Um, sometimes in my left hand with thumb over the neck. Some some people ask me about my picking because it's kind of unusual. Mm. And I think the the good thing about that is that it's unusual because it's kind of tailored to my body and my hands. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to play the way I see another person play. I'm not trying to pick like George Benson mm. or like, you know, Joe Bonamassa or like Pat Metheny, all these people that have their great unique things that they do, uh, which I can't do. And I feel like if I try to, I might injure myself um, because my body's not meant to work like that. Um, so the only advice I can give is, is do your thing um, and do it relaxed. That's the other thing is I, I, I do play very relaxed and I, I play light. You know, I play light and relax because I play a lot. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I didn't, I might, you know, I play in a way that achieves the sound that I want, but it's also uh, suited to playing as much as and as often as I do. What gear do you have? So now we're going to talk a little bit about your equipment. Um, gear. I mean, I have a lot of different guitars. I have a lot of different amps, some stuff that I particularly like. I love that Strat that I've had since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um I have uh, my friend James Valentine has a signature guitar. A music man, right? Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic guitar. Um, I have a Paul Reed Smith that I've been enjoying lately. Mm -hmm. um, I have a Fender Electric 12 that I love. <laughs> I have a good all acoustic that I love. Um, I have some new stuff coming. I, I have a Richard Hears arch top, which is also really stunning. Um, I have some Sadowski stuff that we're working on. I don't mm. have it, but I will have a Sadowski strap pretty soon that I'm really excited about. Um, what else? Um, do you have three three five at home? I do have a three three five, but I I don't love the three three five I have, and I would like to get a three thirty instead. Mm. I'm actually looking to trade it for a three thirty because I feel like those. To me, are, they're more the sound that that I'm after a little bit. Mm. Um, and you're looking for? Are you looking for new instruments or vintage instruments? I tend to like instruments that have been played a little bit. Um, mm. But you know, there's something about a brand new like the Sadowski is going to be new, and I it, I can tell already it's going to be much more efficient and uh, I mean just it's going to be better in every way than what I have, but the challenge for me will be getting used to something like that. Mm. Cause I'm used to things that are a little bit broken and busted and that's kind of the charm of it for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a good, a good mix of that I think is good. Um, amps, I have, um, you know, a bunch of different fender stuff, a deluxe and a super and a vibra, an old vibra lux. I have, um, a plexi Marshall. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite amp. That's my best amp. Um, 
I have uh, an old AC30, which is amazing. And then the new technology stuff, I, I do have a Kemper, which I think is pretty cool. Mm. Um, so that stuff, pedals-wise, uh, you know, I'm using the same stuff as everybody else. The, the one thing that I'm really super, super excited about is um, everything that Jesse Davey makes, mm -hmm. King Tone pedals. Um, those are so special. I, he's just a genius. He's an amazing guitar player, but the the uh, the pedals that he's making, I think, are unreal. So I, I just got two new ones. I already had the Duelist, and uh, I just got the Blues Power, which I haven't jumped into yet, but... I've been using the Octa Octa Fuzz, mm -hmm. the Octa Land. Yeah. It's unreal, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so I'm I'm very excited about those at the moment. Well, what strings do you have on your guitars? They're Diodario. Mm -hmm. I've been using Diodario basically my whole life, and they're thirteens uh, with an unwound G at the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, yeah, that was inspired by Stevie Ray Vaughan, who was you know my first real superhero, and still is. And what collector do you have? I use the, the Jim Dunlop Jazz Threes. Just three. Yeah, I'm you, see, you see, you, you mentioned you mentioned different amplifiers. So when you're setting up your amplifiers, what kind of tone do you hear in your own head? The sound that you're looking for in terms of this is middle, this is treble, this is bass. How do you like to set it up? What is the sound that you're looking for? Something clear, rounded, in the middle? Yeah, it's so, something that I can control. You know, something that the that I can give life to. You know, if it's if it's sometimes if it's too fully formed on its own, I feel like I have nowhere to go with it. But all those amps, you know, they, they have, you can push and pull them in different ways, you know, and then the basic thing is always still, their own unique character is always there. So I, I do like that too. I want them to have their own unique thing. Um, I think, you know, I do want, I do want enough clarity, but I, I, mainly the thing I'm looking for is warmth, you know, I, want it to, I don't want it to be like, you know, sometimes those uh, solid state jazz amps are warm in a way but it's it's a bit lifeless yeah so i want it to be warm but also to have you know life to be vibrant hmm. Hmm. so in, in your pedals let's say if you have distortion what kind of sound for distortion you're looking at you know something that is you know describes 60s or 70s rock or something that is more like 80s or something that is just a little hint of a distortion for your tone uh i definitely you know there's I appreciate those, all those different flavors. And, you know, in, in my search for textures, I think I've probably played with, with all of those. Mm. My default is to go with something that's not overly uh, articulated as distortion. Mm. You know, sometimes when I hear, like, this is my distortion sound, I feel like it's, it's too much and it doesn't fit with the music. So I want something that kind of blends in a little bit. That's my default. Of course, there are times when you need distortion, distortion, and it has to be super clear that it is what it is. So I feel like distortion is one of those pedals where, like, you might want to have more than one variety and know how to use it in different ways and because it's a complicated thing. Mm. It's, not, it's not just an open and shut. You know what I mean? Like, you know, a great drummer can play at a thousand different volumes, you know, not just one or two. They have their master of dynamics. Mm. And I feel like as guitar players, we have to be close to that with tone, right? Mm. We have to know it's not just distortion pedal on or off. It's what are the different varieties? What are the different shades? Advice for musicians. I always believe that you can do it mm. because you can, and but you have to try. Mm. I mean, and you won't know until you push to the other side, mm. and you won't ever make it to the other side unless you push to the other side. You know what I mean? Like like we said, like nothing's granted to you in this thing. You have to you have to put in the effort. You have to put in the work, mm. but. There's nothing stopping you from getting to the other side other than yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, that's a very simplistic look at a much bigger question. Of course, there are factors working you know, to make it more difficult for you than they might be for some other person that might have this, this or that advantage. But despite that, we're all capable of doing it. You know, and I, I have to tell myself that sometimes, you know, and, um, you know, just to, to not, To, to, to take the challenge, first of all, hmm. to attempt it, you know what I mean? Instead of saying, oh, well, I can't do that, you know, whether it be like, oh, I can't play giant steps or I can't play an open E tuning or I can't lead a tour or I can't play Madison Square Garden or I can't sell a million copies of my record. You know, you can do any of those things. You just have to find your own way to do it.
and it might require some unconventional thinking, and it's definitely going to require a whole lot of work. So, but I, you know, I tend to believe in people. Oh, that's very, very nice ending. Mir, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right, thank yeah. you so much, man. Okay, see you. Great to see you, man. Take care. Take care brother. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>